The Destruction of Black Civilization, Part 12. A View from the Bridge. This has been an interpretation of history. I have swept across 6,000 years with the history of the African people, touching here and there on prehistoric beginnings such as Wose and selectively spotlighting the blackout areas in the history in my broad sweep through the millenniums. My own field studies in just about every region of the continent and my interpretation even of the data of many of the scholars appearing in the bibliography often led to quite different conclusions than theirs. Indeed, these modern Westerners either ignore or contradict some of the best evidence of the ancient writers of Africa. The conflict of viewpoints on the history of the Africa people develops as issue in the work and I suppose that at the present level of civilization such a conflict should be expected between those who represent the masters of the globe and those who are in rebellion against them as the writers of the history of the people they oppressed. Invariably there is a deeply felt need to present the dominated people as childlike creatures inferior by an ordinance of nature and therefore helpless without the permanent rule and guiding hand of the master race. Perhaps the highlights in the history of the blacks, which is all this work claims to be, would be even more clearly understood if I had written backward, beginning with the present. For one thing, less documentation would be required. For by focusing on predominantly black South Africa, Zimbabwe, and the present day Sudan, the whole world could see, almost at a glance, exactly what happened to the black Egypt many centuries ago. The script of the play, Whites Against Black, is the same. The eternal drive glorifying white blood is the same. Finding direct expression in all Caucasian controlled social and economic systems. In South Africa, the Dutch offsprings by black women are classified as colors and ranked as a separate ethnic group below the Dutch in social and economic status, but far above the Africans. In Egypt, the colors gradually become the majority as more and more whites came in and more and more blacks moved southward. The name Egyptian was taken over by the whites and their northern colors as applying to themselves alone. The blacks who were the original Egyptians were no longer called Egyptians, just as the blacks in Africa today are no longer called South Africans there. Only the whites are South Africans. Both in Egypt and South Africa, the scheme was to make the mulattoes a separate ethnic group superior to the blacks because of Caucasian blood, thus creating mutual hatreds that would make unity difficult if not impossible. By giving all mulattoes privileges and opportunities denied to blacks, the scheme not only worked in South Africa and ancient Egypt, but it was successful throughout the world and it still operates in the closing years of the 20th century. The white man has every reason to proudly view his handiwork in managing people and pronounce it good. In the Sudan, the white Arabs were so successful that their colors and looked down contemptuously on the blacks in the southern Sudan exactly the same as the Egyptian colors regarded the same once all black religion Ethiopia centuries ago. The picture in the northern Sudan today then is exactly the same as the picture was in northern Ethiopia after it became predominantly Afro-Asian and Afro-European and the picture in the southern Sudan today is the same all black picture southern Ethiopia, the Sudan itself, presented over 2,000 years ago. And just as their ancient forefathers battled then against the Egyptian colors, the blacks in the southern Sudan at the very hour these lines were being written were still arrayed in battle against the Arabs, now predominantly colored and for the same ancient reasons. Does anyone wonder why this all-important white created color factor is skipped over by white historians? If they were scientific in their approach and objective in their methods, they would deal with the mulatto role in black history. Even though it was a major source of white power, 
and the white man's most effective agent in helping to destroy black civilizations everywhere they were found. White historians would really grow in stature if they themselves wrote the story, wrote it as it was. This would never happen, of course, for they would be recording how the increasing numbers of colors after each white invasion made it easy to credit them with all of the great advances the blacks themselves had made. They, the white writers, would be telling how these half-blacks came to be classified as caucasoids and how helpful this was in obliterating black Egypt from the pages of history. By this masterstroke, through their own sexual creations, they were able to erase the blacks as the first builders of a great civilization and deliberately rob them of that honor. The long drawn out process by which all of this was accomplished has been detailed in this work. It had to be dealt with along with other factors and forces because the inferior status of black people throughout the world today tends to conform the white man's doctrine that they are inferior in fact. His whole system, universally applied, was designed to make them inferior and keep them so. Who then in the 20th century would believe that the same blacks were of the race that had built great cities, developed writing, the arts of science, and when the whites of Europe were still roaming tribes of barbarian warriors, this being a well-known, though not publicized, fact of history, how then explained the descent of blacks from the heights reached by their forefathers to the paths in which they find themselves today. This was the central question in all of our research. Most of the important answers are given in preceding chapters. Future research, especially field research, will reveal an even more amazing history. A study of the general history of mankind reveals no people who have suffered so much in every area of life. Future research, especially field research, will reveal an even more amazing story. A study of the general history of mankind reveals no people who have suffered so much in every area of life and survived. One thinks immediately of the Jews and the systematic oppression which they have encountered in every land, but they were not enslaved, not since the days when whites were generally enslaved everywhere and slavery had nothing to do with race. We have seen that white slavery ended after the murderous revolt of white slaves in the 13th century. White slavery ended and thereafter the concentration on blacks alone, the Jews being white and tenaciously clinging to their own heritage were able to find escape routes not open to blacks anywhere, business, finance, and science. They were free to study and study they did surpassing almost all other peoples in the resulting intellectual supremacy. Learning became a second religion. They had seen that two of the certain ways to overcome their oppressors were the mastery of wealth and intellectual excellence. They therefore became money lenders to emperors, kings, and popes. Meanwhile, the blacks were still being hunted down and enslaved, and when free, they were kept as close to the status of slaves as such efforts could achieve, yet today we are beginning, just beginning to learn about the heights from which they were driven. One of the highly important things this study revealed was how the very color of black came to mean slave and therefore equated with bad luck, inferiority, and shame. We have dared to go beyond the limits and the guidelines set for us by the Caesars of history and geography to discover that ancient Ethiopia covered North Africa and the Mediterranean Sea, that Egypt was the northeastern division of that empire, and that even as late as 3100 BC, when white Asians held Lower Egypt, Ethiopians still held most of their homeland in Upper Egypt. In short, almost all of Egypt was as black as late as 3100 BC. I say, as late as 3100 BC. To emphasize the fact again, 
that all this is well known to white historians concerned with Africa. They know because when the earliest Greeks and Roman writers studied in the land, Egypt was still black. They knew that the history was and they left the records. Even when Herodotus arrived, black civilization was known to be so ancient that its beginning was lost in a distant past beyond memory. But when he arrived, he found a very mixed Egyptian population of whites, brown, yellows, and blacks. The first three groups now drawing a line between themselves as Egyptians while giving to the blacks the lowest class status along with their original name of Ethiopians, original as Greek term. There may have been some justice in this sense when Herodotus was in Egypt. The masses of non-integrating blacks had themselves rejected both Egypt and the Egyptian names as the Asians and Afro-Asians became the majority and they had concentrated below a new borderline as Ethiopians in an Ethiopian empire that no longer included Egypt. The most important fact here is that the Greeks were the first Europeans to know that the most advanced civilizations of the ancient world was in Africa. The first Europeans to study and be directly influenced by it and to proclaim it to the world boldly and without reservations. Indeed, it is from Greek history, including their myths and legend, that we get some of the best insights to the early history of blacks. They drew upon the land of the blacks for architectural designs, city planning, sculpture, science, and even religion. These they reshaped and made Greek. The Greeks were the best traveling students in the world, and their relations with Africa they exemplified as no other people had the electric process of civilization and progress, the readiness to borrow from other people the best in their culture, to be reshaped or made over to suit one's own ideas and needs. Having lost some of our own written records through destruction, endless displacement, and the gradual loss of African scribes, the black world owes the debt of everlasting thanks to those early Greek and Roman writers, but mostly Greek, who had concluded, who had included much of our ancient history with their own and passed it down through centuries. We salute them. The early disruption of African civilization, as we have seen, was followed by a long series of absolute blockades to progress. These included the combined forces of nature, ever-expanding deserts, scarcity of water, hostile climate, and the ravages of the seas arising largely from conditions of famine. And yet, while the primary causes of disasters had, from the earliest times, set in motion the dispersions of people searching for survival sites, through it all, kingdoms and empires were built, destroyed, and built again. These were the slow-moving voluntary migrations from which so many of the small and large societies developed with different languages and dialects. The invaders, raiding into the continent from Asia and Europe, formed the second century's long battle fronts against the blacks had to fight for survival. These wars spanned several thousand years, and in an earlier chapter, one wondered out loud and still wondered how any people weakened by perpetual hunger and disease could possibly carry on wars of resistance to the white invaders for over 5,000 years. This they did, and this their descendants must know and remember with pride that black resistance to white domination covered over 5,000 years when the enslavers pressed in upon them from the north, the east, the west, and from the south. They continued the fight. The resistance to slavery continued while the continent was being depopulated by it with active participation of many black chiefs and kings seeking wealth and the white man's promise of security from all of their black foes. The third battle lines for survival were therefore internal and point up one of the main contributions they made towards their domination by other people. 
As time went on, they became so preoccupied with warring against each other that they seemed to regard the whites as friends by comparison. This seeming contradiction is baffling. For while there is nothing new about a people fighting among themselves, they generally stop if outsiders attack, forget their differences, and join united ranks against the common foes. Caucasians will wage frightful wars against other Caucasians, but will quickly unite as though by instinct against non-whites, not only in war, but in international policies. They have developed a kind of built in solidarity in their relations with non-Caucasian peoples. This fact, as much as anything else, helps to explain their position as masters of the world. On the other hand, and in glaring contrast, this unity and non-cooperation have been characteristics of black societies. And this fact, more than anything else, helps in the understanding not only why the blacks eventually lost in their battles against the whites, but also why even today they are still unable to deal with the white world. This situation of antagonism, self-hatred, and attending disunity in the race is a matter of such grave concern that I have returned to it again and again throughout these discussions. The only reasons for dealing with the role played by the mulattoes in black history, for example, was to show how baffling and complex the problem is, for they were used to not only to help to disguise the most significant achievement of blacks, but they were also effectively used to further enhance and perpetuate the already existing conflicts and divisions among them. Now, they had just as much right to be classified as white as they did to be classified as black. But they found it expedient to operate in both worlds, exploiting the blacks while serving the interests of the whites. There could never be any clear-cut judgment or defense against internal subversion along any color line because in almost every black society it was possible to find any mulattoes who were as loyal to the race as anyone could be and as well pure blacks who might be paid agents of the Arabs or Europeans. The state of black Africa then was a state of perpetual fears, fears of being hunted down and attacked from without, fears of betrayals by unknown followers from within, fears of attacks by other migrating blacks who were themselves fleeing from danger, fears of hunger, ever mounting disease and of the alarming number of deaths. These fears of all kind were a disease, all producing an alarming source of mutual suspicion and distrust. Centuries of this produced an amazing outcome. Blacks became their own worst enemies and therefore increasingly a helpless people. The migrations were the moving phenomena in the tragedy. For while we have seen that many of them ended with the rebirth of a new state from one end of the continent to the other, states that stood still until Arabs and Europeans delivered the final death blows, millions of their blacks were unable to achieve this temporary glory. These were the Africans whose daily task was sheer survival, nothing less nothing more. Every one of their communities had four to six months of each year with everyone new as starving times. The period when children ate dirt and the bark from trees when it was a great occasion if food enough could be found for two or three meals a week. When to find a water hole or a little stream that had not completely dried up was even more joyful than finding something to eat and a time when some mothers were still away into the bush with their little skeletons like children with swollen bellies to die quietly in the shade. This was starving times. During this awful period of hell on earth, even the better off cattle raising groups outside of the Tasti flight regions suffered great losses in herds as they wandered far and wide in the frantic search of unparched grassland and water. In none of this are we dealing with the merely unusual misfortunes which are occasionally visited upon almost every people. No, we are dealing here with the unusual, something quite different 
in the general experience of mankind for we are reviewing here a permanent situation which in combination with the forces outlined in foregoing pages destroyed the civilization of an entire race check progress and force countless thousands into barbarism there were the people who sought freedom and security in the forests swamps and caves some unable to advance under these conditions nevertheless battled against sinking to the level of savages some rebuilt their states even in the vast forests and still others famine crazed became savages or semi-barbarians Many of the groups that descended to this lower state of existence were isolated in areas where starving times was not a period of months, but of years. The worst outcome from the forced migrations all over Africa in the long search for places of refuge and freedom were the endless splintering off of societies into countless little isolated states. Overall, it is difficult to see how if it had been otherwise. They had to split up. Unity in terms of keeping a very large group together was impossible. Seldom could 10,000 people move in Marseille, not to mention 100,000. And 100,000 would be a small number if it was a great state that was being disorganized and destroyed. If they were being attacked by invaders, not only expediency, but life itself dictated that they split up into small groups under each an elected leader. And this way, both the chances of escape from the enemy and of finding food and water somewhere were better than we would be in case if they moved in one vast body. Some of these separated groups did indeed meet again by chance before they had become the total strangers of each other. These often settled in the same region and near enough to each other to maintain the same language. Others met again generations after the original segmentations as strangers speaking in different tongues and with different patterns of culture. Strangers, yet all descended from the same society. Worse still, the blacks have been so busy being different through all of these years that they've been unable to see the underlying all of their cultural varieties is the compelling evidence that they are all members of the same race and have the same common origin. The most remarkable outcome of the migrations with their fragmentations, disunities, and interminable turmoil and crisis is that they held on tenaciously to the same democratic and political systems and the same social institutions maintained from one end of Africa to the other, just as though they were still members of one and the same vast African society. This fact was immediately reflected in the institutions and political structure of every new state that emerged during all those centuries of migrations. Just as the council told Ethiopian kings what they could and could not do, the same remained true throughout the continent where black rule prevailed according to tradition. This was why 3,000 years later and 3,000 miles further south, a Shaka could complain bitterly because of the Zulu council of yes men failed to check him in his excess, finding himself an absolute autocrat. He was surprised to find that he had been allowed to get away with it. When then is the viewpoint from the bridge? The outlook is grim. For the black people of the world, there is no bright tomorrow. The blacks may continue to live in their dream world of singing, dancing, marching, praying, and hoping because of the deluding signs of what looks like victories, still trusting in the ultimate justice of the white man. But a thousand years hence, their descendants will be substantially where they were a thousand years before. While the white people still masters of the world do not have to yield, they have never changed their real attitude toward black people during all the passing centuries, and there is absolutely nothing upon which to base the belief that they will change in the centuries to come. Concessions on some demands, yes, expediency dictates this. Nothing that the black masses accept as leaders, any and all Negroes who hold important positions, the whites, 
who control these positions directly or indirectly actually determine who the leaders of black shall be as independent black organizations emerge. The dangling attractions of government and foundation grants are there to quiet the outspoken but money hungry leaders. Indeed, some of these leaders were quick in discovering the most certain route to a handsome grant or loan is pretended outrage and shouting militancy. The whites know all of this too well. They are quite willing to pour millions of dollars into all kinds of black community projects precisely because they know what these phony leaders will do nothing that they really improve the conditions under which the black masses live. Blacks are still hopelessly naive if they do not yet understand the whites that the whites never did and do not now intend to include blacks in the doctrine of human equality, equal justice, or anything else that means real equality. The white determination to keep blacks in an inferior position is so deep that they will battle against the enacting of civil rights laws even when they know there will be no real enforcement. The opposition is to the very idea of equality. Those Negroes who are so fanatically fighting to escape from the African race by way of integration and allegation will continue to meet everlasting and universal opposition from the whites. The Negro drive to be with the whites in every situation is equaled by white determination to prevent it. Yet, the whites must truly feel a deep sense of pride in seeing this Negro leadership so clearly validating their own belief in white supremacy. Their pretended quality education objective actually collapses under the wheels of buses for racial balance. They are proclaiming to the world that regardless of their general delegation in any all black or predominantly black population, the blacks themselves are utterly incapable of achieving or maintaining high standards of excellence in education or indeed anything else. Here we have within the race the intolerable situation of the anti-black group proclaiming the race inherit inferiority more effectively than the whites ever could precisely because this group is regarded as black furthermore and even of the greater importance and allegationist negroes generally hold most of the administrative and key teaching posts in the educational system through sheer indifference Therefore, they can block the development of the quality education in black schools while at the same time sending their own children to white private schools. Their remaining interest in the black schools is the money derived from their superiority and teaching positions. Meanwhile, black students in the so-called integrated schools and colleges throughout the United States continue to tell the world that they are segregated within as they are without. From being accepted, daily insults of various kinds occur inside the classroom, inside the halls, and on the outside. When fights break out, as they inevitably do, and the police are called in, they generally arrest the black students, not the white students, no matter who started the trouble. A press report, September 15, 1972, simply read, During the recess hour, a black male student was called an offensive name by two white boys and pushed against the wall. A general fight broke out between the black and white students. Police were called. 13 black students were arrested in jail. Now, of course, all of this is public information and is news to no one, but some of the salient facts that seem to stand out clearly are as follows. One, white America is definitely unalternably opposed to integration and allegation of the two races. Two, black America, the masses are equally opposed to the integration and allegation of the races. Three, the drive for more and more allegation is and always has been spearheaded by those colors who maintain a separatist society within the black race and who are not and never have been identified with the black masses. Since everybody knows that there are millions of light-skinned members of the race, 
some as white as any Caucasian, who are as African in spirit and are as devoted to the race as anyone else, the crucial question is how long will this other white-oriented group be allowed to block the real progress of the race? Five, those who seek and hope for admittance into white society should not be criticized or condemned. As previously stated, it is an individual's matter of choice and it is both natural and right of their blood call is to the white race rather than to the black. But they cannot be allowed to use their imposed leadership positions to browbeat all black Americans into the line of march toward white society per se and thus towards the ultimate extinction of blacks as such in this country. It is along this line against their benign genocide that the real battle for survival as a distinct people must be fought. Six, the drive for integration is most damnable on one score alone. It is a deliberate and step up attack on the most significant aspects of the black revolution of the 60s. The revolt was the revolt in the psychology of the race, a quest for its lost manhood by first emancipating the mind from the bondage of over Caucasianization and to establish forever the real basis for equality with the rest of mankind from the rediscovered pages of history that was supposed to be lost because it reveals a long line of giants unsurpassed by any people on earth. The Negro integrationalists are hostile to black revolution and aim to defeat its main aims by forcing the black children and youth of the nation more directly under white education. Once again, as in slavery, they would be cut off not only from the history of their race, but they would also be cut off from a knowledge of all of other fields in which blacks have excelled and from which comes the inspiration to go forth and do likewise. The great mental revolution among the blacks that eventuates in more and more self-respect and a new sense of manhood and self-worth, all this alarms the Negro integrationalists and they are resolved to defeat it by keeping the blacks firmly under the mind control of white institutions. They are absolutely right about the general lack of quality education in black schools, the very schools in which they are the principal supervisors and teachers, but their mind and interests are elsewhere. Ghetto children are unteachable, they assure themselves, and they and their equally misguided principals and teachers of all kinds will fight to the death a Clark or any plan that is expressly designed to improve the teaching and learning processes in black schools. They fear the very idea of community control because it presents the possibility that the irate parents might demand the removal of merely job holding and indifferent principals and teachers. Eight, the millions of Africans of mixed blood who have been always steadfast and devoted to the race know that when the white man gives them a preferential status above the unmixed but always below himself, he does so to maintain the myth of superior white blood. Their redemption from the sin of African blood is proportionate to the amount of white blood in their veins. Indeed, if one is light enough or near white, he may have been appointed secretary of a department of the U.S. government and a member of the president's cabinet and still not equal. Furthermore, white America has found that their purposes were served best by classifying as Negro all persons with any amount of African blood, no matter how small. This obvious injustice has been openly challenged even by those directly affected and who bitterly resent being classified as such. But the United States refused to follow either the South African system of making their Afro-Dutch offspring a separate ethnic group by law and calling them colors, or the ancient practice of Egypt and the Arab world of classifying mixed breeds as whites. This fact has a tremendous impact on integrationalist Negroes in the United States leading many to identify with the Arab world rather than Africa and even to adopt Arabic names rather than African names. In fact, 
because of their powerful hold on Africa through the religion of Islam and the vast colored population in many Arab states, many white Arabs will publicly state for African is that they are the non-white people. However, even if the United States did attempt to reclassify this group as either white or colored, the millions who are bound to the African race by unbreakable ties of love will fight such a move to its death. These have no desire to be either white or colored, for like the late Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, who could have passed for white anywhere in the world, they would say, call me black, knowing full well that the black refers not to anyone's color, for which none is responsible, but black defines one's attitude toward the homeland of his ancestors from his times immemorial was called the land of blacks. Something different developed in black America for whereas in most other parts of the world, the mulattoes form an elite caste. This is true only of certain groups in the United States, such as the Wet Sox of Maryland and Virginia, also known by other names, and they are spilled over in Washington, D.C. In general, the divided loyalty split them as anti-African and pro-African, which is the way it has always been. The view of the bridge thus has far been a refocus on the futility of our continuing and childlike faith in the white man's justice and belief that our progress, marching demonstrations, singing and praying will change his 6,000 years of hostility towards us and that the Negro who frantically battled for admission to white suburbia and to his private clubs, golf courses, swimming pools, etc. will never be welcomed even though they may be near white in color. The final focal point in this connection is that the masses from the blackest of the blacks to the lightest of the lights do not care at all about socially mixing with the whites. They, the whites on their part, have no reason or inclination to do more than make token concessions from time to time, thus quieting noisy leaders, but never changing the inferior situation of the masses. They still own and control the wealth of Africa, directly and indirectly, and from it, along with that from other areas of the world, they have developed technologies and a world commerce, all fully protected by governments, also under their control, that assure them of continued white supremacy. This phenomenon of success, this unquestionable position of strength derived from the conquest of other peoples and their wealth has led them to believe that they are, as a matter of fact, the superior people and therefore the rightful rulers of this planet. Why then should they be expected to yield? Human rights, equal justice, what are these but narcotic slogans for the masses, even white masses, which are quickly conceded as ideals and principles everywhere? The masses of poor whites also live on these slogans and ideals of equal justice. They are a pitiful people, often have starved themselves, yet living and having their being in a happy thought that they are members of the white conquering race and that the once enslaved blacks among them are living evidence of their own superiority. They enjoy the glory reflected from the domination and power achieved by the ruling minority of their race, too ignorant to realize that they are used as the tools of hate to support their wealth and power concentrated in relatively few hands. When these poor whites secure that kind of jobs that move them up in the glory land called the middle class, they get the most concrete evidence of their innate superiority. They find that the economic system is so structured that, one, to secure better jobs and advancement, the number one qualification is to be white. Two, that even where only a token number of non-whites are employed, they may be required to have college degrees and sometimes the masters, while the high salary whites, including the supervisors, may not have a high school education. These are merely may and may not theories. 
In the United States, the official statistics show that nationwide, black college graduates not only earn $1,000 and $40,000 a year less than white high school graduates, but they earn less than a white 10th grader. The white college graduates averages $3,095 more than the black college graduate. Blacks must pay more to live than whites. The lower wages they receive and the higher prices they must pay are built-in guarantees that they will always occupy an inferior place in the society. Merchants now generally have two prices for the same goods, one black and one white. With the uneducated black, they are having a field day. They are equally successful in robbing the educated black middle class because of its abiding faith and status striving complex. These are the Negroes who readily pay $225 a month for a house just vacated by whites who rented it for only $125 and Negroes who buy $25,000 homes listed to whites for from $5,000 to $10,000 less provided of course that the white folks previously lived there and the inner city food markets charge higher prices for cheaper brands of canned goods and equally high prices for leftovers from their first class stores in surrounding white suburbia and for the insurance companies face this economic war on the blacks boldly and actually they simply charge blacks more for less benefits blacks must pay higher premiums than whites for life insurance for example because it has been determined that their life expectancy is 10 years less than that of whites. For the insurance industry, it is strictly a matter of business. They know that the total economic system is so structured against the blacks that it is impossible for them to maintain proper health standards. Being black, they must die first by 10 years. All this gives comfort and assurance to the poor and once poor silent majority. They feel that they have every reason to be silent, for does not this silent and secret war against the blacks carry on every hour of their existence and deeply structured in the vast fabric of national life, public and private, does this not reassure them every day that they are indeed members of the supreme ruling race? The view from the bridge had to focus first on the United States because so much points to this land as the place, as the place where the first major racial explosion is likely to occur. One would think that South Africa feels more secure with huge American investment and military backing that America itself is. This brings us to the main reason for the focus on America. It quickly assumes the role of the whole white west as the various powers were forced from the imperial rule in Asia and Africa, forced, that is to say, from direct political rule or the political functions of colonialism. The world at large, in the greatest misconception of modern times, took this to mean African independence at least, African freedom and the end of European colonialism. The plain truth is that the African states today are not even half free and independent. For colonialism was from the beginning exactly what it is today, an economic system for the control and exploitation of the wealth of other peoples. It was and it is a private enterprise system. Colonial government was initially company government. When the political task got too big, because of the increasing rivalries between the great powers, the mother countries would appoint colonial governors and other administrators. In other words, government by the home country came in as a protecting umbrella for the main objective, economic exploitation. That economic control still prevails all over Africa. It is not neocolonialism, but the old colonialism itself still carrying on the beautiful and high flying flags of independent African nations. The various mineral resources are so vast and involve 
so many billions of dollars that individual Africans called upon to decide whom they would serve, their people or the masters of the country's wealth often decide to serve the latter. The fact that Africa is still in economic bondage to her former political masters bring us back to our point of departure. As the more political colonialism disappeared, the United States rushed in to fill the breach. To take up the banner as the leader of the free world, the Atlantic or Western powers, the American military bases scattered all over the world, have meaningful far beyond than any supposed communist threat. Rich European nations no longer need to maintain their usual armies for defense. For their great white brother, Uncle Sam, will gladly draft men to keep American forces there. American armed might is everywhere, ready to rush in and play the self-assigned role. This new world mission of the United States replaces, as far as it can, the more direct rule of the Western powers over the non-white people. The threat to black Africa and black people everywhere should be obvious. From the beginning, for example, the American secret policy was to give little or no assistance to Africa. Outright grants, such as the billions poured into Europe, were never expected by the black nations. The Africans had sense enough to know that such free gifts were for whites only but they did expect to secure loans on reasonable terms of repayment. The American attitude on loans to African states turned out to be about the same as it would have been if they had been begging for grants. There was a very definite African policy, however. The policy was not to announce the policy. There was a public announcement of what was intended as a policy early in 1960s. It is said to Africa, in effect, that the United States will continue its friendly interest and, as always, said little or nothing in manner of loans. Other friendly advice include the well-known information that they could only apply to the World Bank, the big American air and military base in Ethiopia made a favored African state like Libya, American investments in two other African states enable them to secure the loan. The black nations that might overcome the foreign economic stranglehold within their countries by increased production and exports for foreign exchange find their export trade blocked by the tariff walls of the same United States and the same European powers whose industrial machines would be crippled without the wealth, mineral resources, and basic strategic materials they still control and ship out of Africa. In a word, the blacks neither own nor control the wealth of their own land. Supposedly free again, they are unable to rebuild even as well as their migrating forefathers did before the Arab and European conquest. As shown in previous chapters, freed of the white man's control, a control from which most of them were fleeing, they were overriding all obstacles and successfully building and rebuilding new states until they were finally overtaken in the 19th and as late as the beginning of the 20th century. The overall view from the bridge then is simply the view of where and how the black people of the world stand today after a summary review of at least 6,000 years of their history and whether the focus is on Africa, the Caribbeans, the Americas, or elsewhere, they are now seen standing at the crossroad of history and confused.